Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of graphic material that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. Today we're going to take a deep dive into the Apostles of Infinite Love, a sect which began as one man's disagreement with the Catholic Church and grew into a destructive cult with thousands of followers all over the world. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T.com. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there, because a new episode comes out every Tuesday. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram, at Parcast, and on Twitter, at Parcast Network. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. The Apostles of Infinite Love began in 1950 in France, when the original leader, Michel Collin, proclaimed himself Pope. It then jumped to Quebec, Canada in 1961, when Colin met another discontented Catholic priest, Jean Gaston Tremblay, and ordained him into his separatist sect. At their height in the mid-1970s, the Apostles claimed to have as many as 120,000 followers worldwide. Most practiced from individual house communities, scattered throughout Europe and the Americas. But the largest group, of over 300 devoted Apostles, lived in a cloistered commune in saint Jovita, Quebec, under Jean Gaston Tremblay's personal ministry. In part one of our two-part episode, we'll take a look at Michel Collin and Jean Gaston Tremblay, the leaders of the Apostles. We'll cover their histories, their psyches, and how Tremblay took Collin's ideas and followers and turned them into a cloistered cult of devotees which still exists today. In part two, we'll widen our scope to the entire group of the Apostles of Infinite Love, We'll learn about specific members of the cult and what drew them to the organization, as well as the cult's long history of child abuse allegations and conflict with the Quebec police. Michel-Auguste Marie Collin was born in 1905 in Béchy, a village in the Lorraine region of France. Collin had 11 brothers and sisters. He grew up in an extremely Catholic household. From a young age, Collin experienced religious visions, At just seven years old, he reported a conversation with Jesus in which Christ told him, quote, you will become a priest, then a bishop, and finally pope, end quote. His childhood was full of such religious experiences, and it was not long before Colin began to follow the path that Christ had set out for him in his first vision. By 1933, at the age of 28, Colin became an ordained priest in the Roman Catholic Church, He studied at the seminary in Metz and the Faculty of Theology in Lille, and appeared to have a bright future in the church. But then, in 1935, just two years after joining the priesthood, Colin experienced the first of a series of visions that would come to define his life. Colin claimed to have been visited again by Christ and his mother, the Virgin Mary, who consecrated him as a bishop and gave him a holy mission to revolutionize the church. The Catholic Church already had a long history of validating religious and mystic experiences, especially appearances of St. Mary, known as Marian visions. Examples include the Our Lady of Guadalupe appearance, witnessed by St. Juan Diego in 1531, and three visions experienced by Adele Bryce in Wisconsin, 1859. In fact, Collins' visions were related to a famous incident that took place nearly a century before in La Salette, France. That occurrence, during which the Virgin Mary appeared to two shepherd children and predicted the future corruption of the Catholic Church, was vetted by Pope Pius IX and deemed worthy of belief by all Catholics. The acceptance of the La Salette visions by the Roman Catholic Church opened the door to the possibility of a greater Catholic acceptance of Colin's visions. It was not unreasonable for him to expect that the Church would show the venerance for his religious experiences. 
Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for the show. While it is true that some auditory or visual apparitions might be attributed to mental illnesses like schizophrenia, it is more likely that Colin's long-standing religious background, not mental illness, contributed to these experiences. There are several theories on how and why certain healthy people experience hallucinations or visions and what leads them to believe in them. William James, a turn-of-the-century American philosopher and psychologist, was considered the father of religious psychology. He hypothesized in his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, that people's attitudes towards religion fall into two categories, the religion of healthy-mindedness and the sick soul. Basically, optimists and pessimists. Mm -hmm. Healthy-minded people believe that good will always triumph evil. They look at the world and see the good, the glass half full. For the sick soul, the world is full of corruption and evil. These religious pessimists feel that from the bottom of every fountain of pleasure, something bitter rises up. For sick souls, the world is inherently evil and human nature poisonous. In these terms, Michelle Collin was a pessimist, a sick soul. Religious experiences like visions were a way of dealing with the horrors of life. The psyche could take comfort in the assurances of a higher, all-knowing power. The world was certainly a dark place in 1935, when Collin first publicly announced his visit from Christ and the Virgin Mary. Adolf Hitler and his openly anti-Catholic Nazi party had been in power for two years, And World War II loomed on the horizon. France was still recovering from the Great Depression, and religious persecution was on the rise in Europe, if not yet in France. It's not difficult to believe that a man with a lifelong history in the Catholic Church, like Michel Collin, might experience these invigorating, reassuring visions in the form of perhaps the two most iconic figures of Christianity, the Virgin and the Christ. One of the things the Virgin promised during the much earlier La Salette revelation was that the Catholic leadership would lose its way and a great reformation of the church would be necessary. Colin explicitly built on this idea by proclaiming himself a bishop and declaring that he had been ordained to lead that promised reformation. This declaration was not received well by the Roman Catholic leadership, who saw Colin as a usurper of the traditional hierarchy in the church, but they didn't take any action against him. When the Second World War broke out in earnest, the Vatican didn't have time for Michel Colin anymore, so Colin remained a priest within the Catholic Church. Although he didn't have any real clout at this point, Michelle Collins' visions drew a small but loyal group of followers to him by 1939. They styled themselves the Apostles of Infinite Love, in reference to the Catholic idea of God's boundless love for mankind. They roamed all over France, attempting to sway local priests to their Reformation cause. Colin preached a more traditionalist, stringent form of Catholicism than the Roman Catholic Church's leadership, which was slowly loosening some of its rules in the face of modernity. The apostles of infinite love opposed what they saw as a corruption of the faith and sought to return to the strict theocratic power of the past. Colin's new hardline views on Catholicism, as well as his ongoing conflict with the Church, confused his friends outside the Apostles of Infinite Love. People who knew Colin before the war as a local French priest remembered him as relatively easygoing. His friend, Michel Talbot, recalled that Colin had, quote, a small car, a Rosengart, which he lent to young people even if they did not hold a driving license, end quote. But over the course of the Second World War, that laid-back priest was buffeted by the changes that swept through Europe and destroyed the life he'd known. Catholics were among the religious groups persecuted by the Nazis, and the Apostles of Infinite Love hid until they were captured in late 1944. According to Colin, the Apostles were taken to an internment camp in central France, where they were chained to each other for three weeks and threatened with death. Then, after 50 days of imprisonment, Colin claimed that the commander released him on October 23rd. 
Michelle Collin then claimed to have joined the front in December of 1944 and devoted himself to the French troops in need of guidance. His followers scattered, and most either left or died in the Nazi occupation of France. By the end of World War II, Collin was even more zealous in his religious beliefs than before. He continued to preach and gathered a new set of followers. Shortly after World War II, he claimed that he wore a miraculous cross which bled on his chest, and that he had been blessed with stigmata. After the war, Marcel Dagnotti, another early friend of Collins, returned to find the mild-mannered priest changed. He said, quote, What was my stupefaction when I returned from captivity in 1945 to learn of his strange behavior and the grief he was giving to his superiors of the church? End quote. Dagnotti wondered if his friend had been, quote, traumatized by the tragic events of the defeat of our armies and the capitulation of France, end quote. He could find no other explanation for Colin's personality shift. On October 7, 1950, Colin announced to his followers and to his superiors within the Catholic Church that the Christ and Virgin had once more appeared to him, this time consecrating him as Pope. Jesus had specifically told him, quote, you will now sign your name Clement the Fifteenth, end quote. He proclaimed himself Pope, ordained by heaven. Colin did not try to usurp the sitting Pope, but he did claim that they were equals. He said he was mystically ordained in order to prevent the further corruption of the church under its current leadership. Delusions of grandeur like Colin's, which elevated him to the highest position in the Roman Catholic Church, can be signs of mental illnesses like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, it can also be a symptom of narcissistic personality disorder, a common mental illness found among cult leaders. According to the ICD-10, people with narcissistic tendencies exhibit, quote, an enduring pattern of grandiose beliefs and arrogant behavior together with an overwhelming need for admiration and a lack of empathy for and even exploitation of others, end quote. Collins' visions elevated him to the most powerful office in Catholicism and gave him a sacred mission to reform one of the oldest religions on earth. Narcissists have an exaggerated sense of self-worth and often believe they have, or should have, more influence on the world than they do. Cult leaders like Colin attract followers who will bolster their outsized egos and affirm their claims of importance. The Apostles of Infinite Love did just that and supported their leader's claim to the papacy. This public heresy angered the current Vatican Pope, Pius XII, and made it impossible for the Apostles of Infinite Love to gain the approval or recognition of the wider Roman Catholic Church, something Colin had once hoped for. In 1951, after Colin failed to rescind his claims to the papacy in the face of his superior's warnings and disapproval, the Vatican stripped Colin of his official priesthood and condemned the remaining apostles. Robert Raskin and Jill Novacek studied the effects of stress and tragedy on narcissists in the early 90s and found that delusions of grandeur were often a way for narcissists to cope with stress. Michelle Collin was already exhibiting narcissistic tendencies, like those delusions of grandeur, before World War II. It's likely that the extreme anxiety of that period led him to redouble his delusions. Tensions between the Vatican and the self-styled Pope Clement XV worsened over the next decade, until Colin was officially excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church in the early 1960s. Excommunication is the harshest punishment the Catholic Church can level upon one of their own. It strips a person of their membership to the Church. Pope Pius XII took an unusual step further and called for a vitandus excommunication, a rare ruling that compelled all Catholics to shun Colin in every aspect of their lives. The vitandus excommunication was an extreme punishment, only handed down to those the Church deemed extremely heretical and dangerous. It was religious isolation. The Vitandus was considered so severe that the Vatican did away with the practice in the 1980s. But it was allowed in 1961, and the Roman Catholic Church was tired of simply ignoring Collins' claims to the papacy. They decided to lay down the law. 
Unfortunately for the Vatican, Michel Collin wouldn't be dismissed so easily. He was ready to come back swinging and create a thorn in the church's side that would endure for decades. Here's something we think you'll find interesting. If you love the intrigue, analysis, and in-depth research on cults, we have a recommendation for you. It's time to binge on the new Hulu original series, The Looming Tower. The Looming Tower is based on the Pulitzer Prize winning book with the same title by Lawrence Wright, and the show delivers the same level of excellence. This limited series traces the rising threat of Osama bin Laden, while also following the rivalry between the CIA and the FBI. A rivalry that may have helped set the path for the tragic events of 9-11. The storyline is still timely today, and the star-studded cast and incredible visuals makes this series a must-watch. Starring Emmy winner Jeff Daniels, Golden Globe nominee Peter Sarsgaard, and Tahar Rahim as Ali Soufan, The Looming Tower, available now only on Hulu. Now, let's share something else we love at Parcast. I think you all know how much Greg and I love our Bombas socks. On top of being incredibly comfortable, there's so many different styles, patterns, and colors. There's a pair for every occasion. I'm wearing the dress stripe socks in the studio right now. And I have a pair of the ankle socks in my bag for when I head to the gym. Bomba socks feature arch support, a seamless toe, and stay-up technology. That's right, no more pulling up your socks all day. My favorite thing about Bombas, though, is that for every pair you buy, they donate a pair to someone in need. If you want to be comfortable and give back, it's time you add Bombas to your sock drawer. Buy your new socks at bombas.com slash cults today and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash cults for 20% off. Bombas.com slash cults. Now, let's get back to the story. Pope Pius XII handed down the harshest punishment available to the Catholic Church, a vitandus excommunication to the heretical anti-Pope Michel Collin in 1961. At this point, Collin struggled to attract new members to his community. Most Catholics weren't interested in the thoughts and teachings of a man the Pope deemed dangerously heretic. By the early 1960s, the Apostles of Infinite Love consisted of little more than a handful of elderly priests, and so they might have been disbanded, if not for the intervention of a French-Canadian priest. Jean Gaston Tremblay was born to a poor Quebecois family in 1928 when Michel Collin was already 23 years old. His early life was steeped both in religion and in tragedy. The Tremblay family was very pious, and the Tremblay children grew up in the shadows of the cloisters. Their parents sent the children to study full-time with the church as young as eight years old. Tremblay's father, a lumberjack, died while Tremblay was still young. In response, his mother retreated to a convent and became a nun. Perhaps this is what prompted Tremblay to join the monastic order, the Brothers of St. John, in 1944, at just 16. It should be noted that this was also during the time of the Second World War. So much of Tremblay's young life had been colored by the horrors of that war. Over a million Canadian men were sent overseas to fight Germany, and tales from the front were covered constantly in newspapers. The monastic order Tremblay joined was the Brothers of St. John, known as the Hospitallers. They ran both hospitals and hospices, and Tremblay worked for a number of years in their facilities, dealing with end-of-life care for hospice patients. As a volunteer caregiver, Tremblay may have endured reciprocal suffering, The National Center for Biotechnology Information defines reciprocal suffering as, quote, the combined physical, social, spiritual, and psychological distress among informal caregivers of hospice patients, end quote. They go on to say that, quote, the constancy and difficulty of caregiving impact their physical quality of life and cause depression, psychological distress, guilt, loneliness, and restrictions on social activities, end quote. 
So Jean Gaston Tremblay was, in those first few years after World War II, an isolated and potentially a lonely and distressed young man who forced himself to see grief and death all around him. It makes sense that he would look to his Catholicism, already such a huge part of his life, to give him stability. His retreat into an extremist version of his faith may have been a coping mechanism. In any case, Tremblay's assignment to the Brothers of St. John proved impermanent. Here's where Tremblay's story starts to mimic Collins. In 1947, only three years after joining the Brothers of St. John, Tremblay had a vision in which he stood in a meadow surrounded by believers who began to slowly file into a huge church. A heavenly voice told Tremblay that one day he would win the hearts of all these followers. This experience was followed two years later by an auditory revelation during which a voice told him to seek permission from the local bishop to lead his own order and preach with all the strength of the first apostles. Tremblay told his church superiors about that vision and received permission by the Archbishop of Montreal to leave the brothers and found a new order. He started the Congregation of Jesus and Mary in 1949. The Congregation of Jesus and Mary began as a handful of Tremblay's friends living in extreme poverty and practicing a nomadic ministry all over Canada. Tremblay's very first disciple was a man called Brother Gilles, age 31. Gilles suffered from epilepsy, but Tremblay convinced him to stop taking his prescribed medication. The awful side effects of the medicine, nausea, fatigue, and tremors, wore off, and Gilles was proclaimed healed. Gilles dedicated himself to Jean Gaston Tremblay's cause, and together they recruited a small group of other zealots. Michael Cunio, a sociologist and anthropologist who studied the Apostles of Infinite Love for several decades, says this early group, quote, spent several years wandering throughout rural and small-town Quebec as latter-day medicants, preaching, begging for food, and sleeping in makeshift hovels, end quote. Tremblay's extreme traditionalism alienated other parishes in the area, who argued that his spiritual terrorism made them all look bad. During this time, Tremblay continued to experience visions and apparitions, and he renamed himself the more religious-sounding Jean Grégoire de la Trinité. He also had another vision, this time of a true pope, elected by God, who he was destined to follow. After a pilgrimage to Israel in 1958, Tremblay decided it was time for him to find a permanent home for his movement. He relocated the community of Jesus and Mary to the St. Jovit area of Quebec, where they started construction on the monastic compound, which would one day house the largest enclave of the Apostles of Infinite Love. In 1961, Jean Gaston Tremblay bumped into Michel Collin passing through Montreal's Dorville Airport. The two men immediately hit it off, recognizing these similarities in their goals for the church and in their own religious experiences. Colin and Tremblay both preached a severe form of Catholicism based on extreme personal poverty and rejection of most modern comforts in life. Followers were required to devote all of their time to the church over their jobs, friends, and even their families. The apostles' leadership demanded puritanical levels of humility, hard work, zeal, and poverty from their followers. They agreed to merge their two religious communities into one. Tremblay even declared that Colin, by now styling himself as Pope Clement XV, was the very same pope he'd seen in a vision almost ten years previously. Tremblay later claimed to have been a submissive Catholic up until the day he met Colin and realized the Vatican was corrupt. Colin and Tremblay's early relationship was one of great friendship and mutual respect. Tremblay pledged himself to Colin's separatist sect, and Colin quickly made Tremblay a bishop in the Apostles of Infinite Love Church, then promoted him to cardinal. Colin returned to Europe and focused his efforts on spreading the apostles throughout the continent, while Tremblay was in charge of the efforts in the Americas. Colin promised that Tremblay would one day be his successor. 
Catholicism has never been known for being particularly liberal or lax in its rules, and yet the Catholic leadership in 1960s Quebec and the surrounding provinces were taken aback by the severity of the Apostles' doctrine. They warned the North American religious community to be wary of the Apostles and condemned the leadership at the cult's St. Jovita Quebec compound for both extremism and heresy. Michael Cunio, who wrote a book on the Apostles in the mid-90s, reports that in 1962, just one year after Colin and Tremblay met, the bishop of the St. Jovita Diocese publicly denounced the Apostles of Infinite Love as a sacrilegious group and warned that any Catholics associating with them would be subject to automatic excommunication. Despite the Roman Catholic Church's condemnation, the Apostles of Infinite Love appealed to many Catholics upset by the more liberal Vatican Pope. The Second Ecumenical Council of the Vatican convened in 1962, the same year that the Bishop of St. Jovita condemned the Apostles. The Council's aim was to try and reconcile the Church with both non-Catholic Christians and with modern life. Pope John XXIII wanted to reinvigorate the Church, saying that, quote, the Church is not a museum of antiques, but a living garden of life, end quote. Colin and Tremblay's shared opposition to these reforms helped the Apostles of Infinite Love spread across Europe and North America throughout the 1960s. In 1963, with Tremblay acting as his right hand, Michel Colin revoked his previous edict about coexisting with the Vatican's Pope. In retaliation for his excommunication, Michel Colin declared himself the one true Pope. He was no longer content to share power with the Vatican Pope and refused to acknowledge the Vatican's authority. He slandered Pope Paul VI, declaring him a usurper and implying he believed Pope Paul VI could be the Antichrist. Meanwhile, Tremblay's followers completed the St. Jovita compound. Brother John and his followers actively recruited outsiders by going door to door and speaking to church groups who might be interested in their fundamentalist ways. The Apostles' catechisms and Tremblay's personal comments on the decline of humanity in modern times were published and circulated by the compound's own publishing house, the Editions Magnificat. Tremblay's teachings were ultra-conservative in many ways, forbidding the use of alcohol and tobacco, and condemning both dancing and sports. Interestingly, however, he did not espouse the anti-communist views of several of his religious cult contemporaries, and wrote in support of both labor rights laws and economic equality. Tremblay saw the apostles as a beacon of light for humanity, leading society out of the dark times of capitalist greed, excess, and church-state separation towards a more enlightened future. Colin and Tremblay ordained more priests and bishops to spread the word. In a break from tradition, women as well as men were allowed to be priests, and the vow of celibacy for clergy was abolished. Relaxing restraints on clergy might have seemed hypocritical in the face of the apostles' criticism of the Vatican's reform measures, but it was necessary to maintain the expansive growth of the cult. But it was still much harder for women to be ordained by the Apostles of Infinite Love than it was for men. Women were only allowed to preach at all female masses and were required to be nuns before they could be ordained. These restrictions did not apply to male clergy. By 1964, the original handful of devotees had grown to 90 full-time residents at the monastery, most of them from Canada and the United States. Worldwide, the apostles claimed that they had as many as 25,000 members. Most of these members lived in small house communities in France, the United States, and Canada. For a while, Colin and Tremblay ran their cult as united co-leaders on opposite continents. But that harmony didn't last long. We're so excited to share this with you. When I'm not listening to podcasts, I love to listen to music. Amazon Music is the simplest way to listen to the music you love, without ads or limits or interruptions. Amazon Music allows you to easily find your favorite songs. If you're listening to a song you enjoy and want to hear similar songs, simply say, Alexa, play more like this. 
Maybe you want to reminisce on some of your favorite memories. You can request popular music from a decade or even a specific year. Engaging with music has never been more natural, simple, and fun. I love that I can use Amazon Music Unlimited to easily find songs for activities like cleaning the house or going for a run. As fans of cults, we think you'll love the playlist we've put together on Amazon Music called Inspired by Cults. You'll find music that connects to cults in some way. There are even songs by Dwight York and Charles Manson on the list. New customers, start your 30-day free trial at AmazonMusic.com. That's AmazonMusic.com to start your 30-day free trial. Renews automatically, cancels anytime. And if you love our show, you'll enjoy the stunning new Netflix original documentary series, Wild Wild Country. In 1981, when the world's most controversial guru, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, built a utopian city near a small town in an Oregon desert, his followers and their way of life clashed with the locals. In this bizarre story of ideology, fundamental rights and power, no one could have guessed the intensity or scale of the conflict that would unfold. As tensions rose between the locals and the guru's followers, neither group would back down, leading to a series of shocking events, including the largest case of illegal wiretapping ever recorded, and the first bioterror attack in U.S. history. With incredible first-hand accounts and rare original footage, Wild Wild Country explores how lines between right and wrong can blur when each side believes their actions are justified. Witness the dramatic and nearly deadly events of this truly wild tale, streaming only on Netflix, this Friday, March 16th. Now, let's get back to the story. A year after declaring himself the one true pope, Michel Collins' visions and prophecies took on a different, more divisive bent. In 1964, Michel Collins predicted doom for the world, as well as for the Roman Catholic Church. He proclaimed that nuclear war was imminent, not a far stretch in the height of the Cold War, and set the date of global destruction for 1965. According to psychologist Leon Festinger, doomsday predictions are a tool for cult leaders to cement their power and tighten their grip on followers. Collins' followers believed that he was the only person who God trusted with the extra knowledge and foresight of the end times. And that meant he was the only person who could help them prepare for it. Anyone who might have been thinking of leaving were dissuaded from breaking ties with the only church that could save them. This prediction transformed Collins' apostles into a doomsday cult. Doomsday cults are similar to cults of religion in that their central tenet is based in belief. But instead of faith in a higher power or deity, doomsday cults believe in the end of the world. Whether brought about by an act of God, a nuclear holocaust, or alien invasion, a doomsday cult's central doctrine involves predicting and either preparing for or bringing about the apocalypse. When the world failed to end in 1965, Collins' visions told him Armageddon would occur in 1969. It seems counterintuitive, but more often than not, failed predictions do nothing to dissuade doomsday cultists. In fact, the fastest expansion of the Apostles' almost 70-year history took place during the mid-1960s, the same period of time when Colin was making these prophecies. As Leon Festinger observed in his seminal study of doomsday cults, when prophecy fails, he said, quote, Suppose an individual believes something with his whole heart. Suppose further that he has a commitment to this belief and he has taken irrevocable actions because of it. Finally, suppose that he is presented with evidence that his belief is wrong. What will happen? The individual will frequently emerge not only unshaken, but even more convinced of the truth of his beliefs than ever before. Indeed, he may even show a new fervor for convincing and converting other people to his view." End quote. Colin explained away the delay by saying, that the original nuclear holocaust had been averted by friendly aliens, humanoids called planetarians. There were apparently 5,000 of these extraterrestrials living on Earth, and only Colin could see their true forms. 
This was a massive, complete break from the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, but even these alien predictions were not enough to drive away many devout members of the apostles. With this new extraterrestrial aspect, the apostles of infinite love actually began to appeal to smaller Armageddon cults. Meanwhile, Tremblay's Quebec compound became the de facto center of the apostles as they faced ever more isolation from the Catholic Church. The Bishop of Quebec refused point blank to even visit the St. Jovita compound. Rumors about abuse occurring within the St. Jovita compound, as yet unsubstantiated, led to conflicts with the police. Though adult members of the sect remain relatively silent about practices and punishments of the Apostles of Infinite Love, there have been several former child members who accuse the cult of physical, emotional, and even sexual abuse throughout the decades. Janet Heimlich, an author and journalist who has written extensively about child abuse within religious structures, identified authoritarian religious groups as a particular danger to children. She said, quote, There are three perfect storm factors that identify a religious culture or community as authoritarian. One, the culture has a strict social hierarchy. Two, the culture is fearful. And three, the culture is separatist. The more intense these three factors are, the more authoritarian the culture is, the more likely children will be harmed. End quote. Strict, hierarchical, fearful, and separatist all certainly describe the St. Jovita community. The compound was raided at least three times by the Quebec police, from the late 1960s up until 1999. On December 12, 1966, the first raid commenced when the Social Welfare Court of St. Jerome deemed the compound an unfit environment for children. The courts ordered the apostles to hand over all the underage children at the St. Jovita Monastery to the authorities, and when Father John refused, the Quebec police raided the sect and seized 17 children. Jean-Gaston Tremblay went into hiding with 55 more children, despite the authorities' threats to shut down the sect permanently. He even declared publicly that, quote, We will fight until the death, if necessary. We will let ourselves be cut up into tiny pieces, but we will not hand over our children, end quote. The Hidden Children of St. Javita incident lasted for seven months, And in 1967, Tremblay was listed as one of Interpol's top 10 most wanted criminals in Quebec for his part in hiding them. Unlike in most altercations between cults and the law, the law blinked first. In 1968, province social workers deemed the conditions at St. Jovita to be not as bad as former members' reports had indicated, and the judge's decision was reversed. The 17 children were returned to the Apostles of Infinite Love, and Tremblay came out of hiding with the remaining youths. But there were consequences that reverberated throughout the Apostles. Colin's confidence in Tremblay faltered in the wake of the scandal. Tremblay traveled to France to try and win back his mentor's public support. But Colin did not return the favor. He rejected an invitation to visit the Quebec Monastery in 1968. The relationship between the Canadian and European branches of the Apostles of Infinite Love became strained, even as their membership grew. Then Tremblay announced in the late 1960s that he had been mystically consecrated as the next pope, just as Colin had once been. He proclaimed himself Pope Gregory XVII, saying that the holy mantle had been passed from Colin to himself. Colin, recognizing Tremblay's popularity among the apostles, bowed to the pressure to acknowledge Tremblay's claims, but he found a way to retaliate. After years of promising Tremblay that he would lead the apostles after Colin's death, Colin named a new successor. In response, Jean Gaston Tremblay officially severed his Quebecois sect from the larger Apostles of Infinite Love group late in 1968. They called themselves the Order of the Magnificat of the Mother of God, and they quickly crowned Tremblay as their pope. The ceremony involved a papier-mâché crown, in pointed contrast to the extravagant ceremonies of the Vatican popes. This heresy earned Tremblay an excommunication from the Vatican. 
The Canadian apostles remained critical of Catholic leadership and of freedom of religion in general. They hoped to revert back to a theocratic society, beginning with the St. Jovita compound and ending with the world. Tremblay's apostles clashed with the Vatican just as Colin had. He frequently accused the sitting Roman Catholic Pope of being a corrupt anti-Pope. In fact, Tremblay publicly accused Pope Paul VI of being a pawn of the Freemasons, elected in order to destroy the Catholic Church. In May of 1969, Colin sent a note to the St. Jovita compound, attempting to reconcile with Tremblay. Perhaps Colin was trying to make things right before the world ended later that year, as he had told his followers it would. Or perhaps he realized that the world wouldn't end and needed to pass the mantle on to someone else to avoid blame or questions. But Colin's motivation for sending this note to Tremblay at this time were not elaborated on within the note itself. It read, quote, May the world know that I ask forgiveness of God, of everyone. Be with us in total union for all that regards the Holy Church, mystical universal pontiff, to help, complete, substitute for, replace me, according to the views of God, and the mysterious times that are coming. Gregory the Seventeenth, God bless you, dear father and brother. End quote. This attempt at reconciliation with Tremblay, after he'd already named another man as his rightful scion, soon created rifts in the unified church Colin had worked so hard to create. In 1974, with the world still intact, Michelle Colin passed away at age 69. The worldwide apostles of infinite love splintered in the wake of their founder's death. Some followed Cardinal Cyprien Damge de Lanois, the man Colin nominated as his successor. Others followed local leaders. But the largest remaining enclave of apostles was still Tremblay's St. Jovita community. Over 300 men, women, and children lived full-time at the St. Jovita Monastery under the watchful eye of their self-styled Pope, Jean Gaston Tremblay. According to the Université Laval's records on the sect, they were taught to, quote, live in contempt of the world and especially of themselves, to them, society is corrupt and perverse and needs to be purified, end quote. Foreign apostles who could not afford to uproot their lives to move to the compound themselves sometimes sent their unaccompanied children to be educated in Tremblay's enclave. But whether their parents were with them at the compound or not, children remained a vulnerable population at the compound. Many of these children later accused Tremblay and other leaders of abuse, neglect, and assault. These sexual abuse scandals would dog Tremblay for the rest of his life. Next week, we'll dive into the child abuse scandals and accusations that rocked the St. Jovita compound for over 30 years. We'll also take a closer look at the people Colin and Tremblay were able to lure into their cult, and the Apostles' numerous clashes with the police. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. Join us here next Monday as we continue to investigate the Apostles of Infinite Love and their long history of conflict with the Quebec police. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Russell Nash, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire, Carly Madden, and Jeanette Manning. Cults is written by Colleen Bradley and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Now that you've finished today's episode of Cults, it's time to binge-watch the new Hulu original series, The Looming Tower, based on the Pulitzer Prize-winning book by Lawrence Wright. The show examines the rivalry between the CIA and the FBI, and how it may have set the path 
for the tragedy of 9-11. The Looming Tower is available now only on Hulu.